Hello class, this is Demetrius Wilson with Business One. This is Chapter 12. We are now discussing unions. At the beginning of the chapter, you'll see a story about getting to know uh, DeMaurice Smith. Uh, he's executive director of the NFL Players Association. I'm sure you've heard of him in the news. Uh, faced off with NFL owners during the 2011 players lockout. Uh, negotiates player and, and ex-player issues uh, like safety and health care. And uh, I posted a video of him uh, speaking in regards to a variety of topics in the Chapter 12 module. Uh, be sure to uh, go over name that company, see if you can name that company, if you just know it over the top of your head. Uh, like I said, this chapter we're discussing unions and uh, what unions mean to you uh, could possibly mean absolutely nothing to you because possibly you work in a non-union environment. But those of you who do work in a union environment, you know that they are very powerful, powerful, uh, can get a lot done uh, for an individual. So a union is an employee organization whose main goal is representing its members in employee management and negotiation of job-related issues. Some uh, you know, companies that you work for, you don't even go and deal with uh, employee management or manager uh, issues. Uh, it just goes straight to the, to the union rep. Uh, so it's a, just a different, very different type of environment during my day job, no union. Uh, but there is a union, uh, obviously, uh, for the campuses uh, that I work at. Uh, different types of union. There's a craft union, an organization of skilled specialists in a particular craft. Uh, so they have, a, hey, this is a steel workers union. All right, this is an automobile, uh, you know, a work uh, assembly line workers union. Right, so they have specific uh, craft unions uh, that are that are set up, and sometimes they have craft unions that are set up, but that expand into other unions. Uh, so be sure to read this in detail. It's more of a chapter where you're just learning of the history and the origin of uh, of unions, uh, so that you know it and understand it for your own edification. Uh, but uh, you know the the test won't have it's just like a lot of uh, questions uh, in reference to like the history of the union. It'll have some, but just it won't be overladen with that. Uh, so while the technological achievement of the Industrial Re uh, Revolution brought countless new products to market and reduced the need for physical labor in many industries, it also put pressure on workers to achieve higher productivity, right? So, hey, we've got these new machines, got this new way of doing things. Now it's more pressure on the people. Um <clears throat> For and they call for long hours, low pay, and you can see how these conditions would affect people. You'll see some of the videos that I posted in the modules, and this is the reason why you know unions came about. And you'll see when you watch the video about unions, it'll talk about how you know people were in there working uh, for you know for entire days, like in there working 16 hours. Uh, you know, and these these are you know women, women, children, men, everybody's in there working. Uh, so who's exactly cooking dinner? Who's exactly going shopping? You have to think about these things and how it was the abuse of people's. Uh, rights and um, as human beings. Uh, so Knights of Labor, this is the first national uh, labor union. It was formed in 1869. So that's a, you know one that you may need to know for a quiz and or for a test. Uh, American Federation of Labor is an organization of craft unions that champion fundamental labor issues founded in 1886. Uh, an industrial union, which is a little bit different from a craft union, is labor organization of unskilled, right? So unskilled, semi-skilled workers in mass production industries such as automobile uh, and and mining, right? So uh, you see those, and I, you know, those are kind of not the best terms to be labeled as, but unskilled and semi-skilled workers, miners, just like, hey, you got to go underground. This is what you need to do. And, uh, you know, if you're on the assembly line, this is what you need to do. Just put this piece here. But you must continue to do it. So uh, they have these industrial unions uh, for those different uh, different sides. Uh, you also have the Congress uh, of Industrial Organizations. Uh, union organizations of unskilled workers broke away from the American Federation of Labor um, in 1935 and rejoined it in 1955. So a lot of times you see people break away from the organization, set up their own organization, and now in this instance they've, you know, they've come back and uh, made amends and now they're all together and uh, holding hands and singing Kumbaya now. So this right here is very interesting. So I want you to make sure that in detail you read this story. This is a very important part of history. Uh, the factory blaze that fired up a movement. So I want you to read that. And then I also want to make sure that you watch the video because there's a video on this actual instance. Whichever you want to read it first or watch the video first. Uh, but you need to understand exactly what happened and how that prompted certain things to change. <clears throat> Yellow dog contract, that's very important. So if I join a company or I'm, you know, interviewing, they say, okay, we're going to give you the job, but 
you have to join this union, right? That's not that's not something that's actually legal. Uh, it's a type of contract that required employees to agree to a condition of employment as a condition of employment uh, not to join a, a union. Uh, so it's uh, prohibited by the Norris LaGuardia Act in 1932. In 1932. So I'm sorry, I said that you uh, wouldn't have the union, but so they're saying we don't want you to join the union. So we'll hire you. But don't don't join the union, uh, and so you you might say, well, why would they say that? Well, they'll say that because of the fact that if you join the union, then it's more power against them, and they can't negotiate with you directly. If you don't join the union, it's more in uh, management's favor. Uh, collective bargaining. This is a process whereby union and management representatives form a labor management agreement or contract for workers, right? So we collectively bargain. We come up with an agreement. This is what we agree to do. This is what you agree to do. Everybody signs on the dotted line. And then we need to adhere to the rules of engagement, you know, relative to the agreement. So these are major legislation affecting labor management relations. So I want you to read, definitely read this in detail on your own. The Norris LaGuardia Act that we already talked about outlawed uh, yellow dog contracts, which say you can get the job uh, as long as you don't sign up for the union. Uh, National Labor Relations Act, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, and the Labor uh, Management Relations Act. Uh, Taff Hartley, that one's very important as well. And Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act. Uh, the Landrum uh, Griffin Act of 1959. So read these in detail uh, because you do need to know, you know, the history in terms of union, especially if you guys end up working for a company that has a union. And uh, if you do, uh, they, they can be very beneficial uh, to you as an individual. Uh, certification. So we'll talk about certification and decertification and how that works. So certification is a formal process whereby a union is recognized by the National Labor Relations Board uh, as the bargaining agent for a group of employees. So they're they're recognizing that these are the people that are going to bargain on behalf of these employees. Now decertification is the other way around. That's not the good thing. Uh, this is a process by which workers take away a union's right to represent them. They say, you know what, we don't want you representing us anymore. We're pulling that right back. Uh, so these are the steps in uh, union organizing uh, and uh, decertification uh, campaigns, right? So if if you look right here and just go straight down the line, if you want to organize a campaign or if you want to decertify, this is what you do. So if you want to organize, you contact uh, employees of an organization, then you campaign for signatures, and the union obtains uh, signed authorization cards from at least 30% of employees. So if you don't have at least 30%, then you're not moving forward, and so on and so forth. Uh, down the line to get all the way down to does the union uh, receive more than 50% of the vote cast and is yes union is certified if it's no then the employer remains non-union so there's some additional steps that you have to go through not so cut and dry uh, but if you want to decertify these are the steps that you need to go through uh, labor union contracted is not in effect and the union has been bargaining agent for at least 12 months uh, so it has to you know go through the process get them at least at least get a year in there then employee or employee representative uh, campaigns for signatures in decertification Petition. So you see in, in both of these processes, you're looking for signatures, you're looking for buy-in uh, from the employee, so and so on forth, so forth down the line. So I want you to read uh, the process of organizing. I want you to read the process of decertification as well. And see if you get down here, you see when that vote, no matter what you do on these other steps, when you get down to that vote, do more than 50% of the votes cast favor of decertifying the union? So if the answer is no, then the union remains, right? The majority does not rule. Uh, <clears throat> so I want you to, to review these uh, as well. Uh, a couple that I'll key in on that you need to know is a closed shop agreement and union shop agreement. So uh, the closed shop agreement, which is interesting, is a clause in a labor management agreement that specify workers had to be members of a union before uh, being hired. Right. So this was outlawed by the Taft Hartley Act. So remember, I said Taft Hartley was in, imp was important. That's the reason why, because it outlawed the closed shop act. But, you know, there's always different ways to get around things. So the Union Shop Act agreement, uh, the clause in the labor management agrees that uh, says workers do not have to be members of the union to be hired, but must agree to join the union within a prescribed time. Right. Uh, so that's not 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 everywhere, uh, but that that it does occur in certain certain instances. And then you have an agency shop agreement, which is similar uh, the clause in a man labor management agreement that says employers may hire non-union workers, employees are not required to join the union but must pay a union fee, right? So you don't have to join, but you have to pay the fee. So what does that lead to? Well, I have to pay the fee anyway, so I might as well just go ahead and join the union. Um, 
these are the issues uh, in a negotiated labor management agreement, right? So look at uh, management rights. So what can the management, what they can and cannot do to you, union recognition, the security clause, strikes and lockouts, like how does that affect? So I want you to go over all 11. Be sure to review those and, uh, uh, and uh, review them in totality because these are things that the unions are going to negotiate. Uh, right to work law. So legislation that gives workers the right uh, under open shop agreement to join or not join a union if it's present. Right, so you do have the right to either join it or you have the right to not join uh, the actual union as well. So these are different forms of union agreements. Uh, we have already gone over those: closed shop, union shop, agency shop, and open shop. But these are in much uh, fancier, nicer colors. So I suggest you review them again right here. Uh, maybe it clicks in your brains to say, uh, "Hey, uh, I can remember it from looking at the, the nice fancy colors." Uh, now, these are the states with right to work laws, right? So you see all the ones in blue? They have right to work, uh, the right to work states. And obviously, we're in California. We are not a right to work state, right? So you say, well, what, what is the right to work? So if you remember a couple slides right back, uh, we went over, uh, the right to work act right there. Uh, so, uh, the Tab Harley Act recognized by the legality of the union shop, but granted individual states the power to outlaw such agreements through the right to work laws, right? Uh, so states to date, 24 states have passed such legislation in a right to work state. An open shop agreement gives workers the option to join or not join a union if one exists. A worker who does not join cannot be forced to pay uh, fees or dues. So cannot force you to pay those fees, cannot force you to pay uh, those dues or to join the union. Uh, then we have a grievance, right? You hear about grievances all the time. So the grievance is a charge by employees uh, that management is not abiding to the terms of the negotiated labor slash management agreement, right? So employees are saying, hey, we agreed to this, but you guys aren't abiding by that, so now I'm going to have to file a grievance. And who do you go to? You have your shop stewards, union officials who work uh, permanently in an organization and represent employee interests on a daily basis. So I'm there. I'm the steward to help you uh, organize and help you get things uh, pushed through uh, appropriately uh, because you're not a union expert. Uh, the grievance resolution process. So check it out. So arbitrator or arbitration panel. So remember arbitration is somebody is going to make a decision. And um, you got side A, say side B. They listen to both sides and then they make a decision and it's binding. But if it's a, a mediator, they just, this is side A, side B. They say with well, this is what we believe the decision should be, but um, you don't have to abide by it. And negotiation is just those two sides sitting down and talking about it. Uh, right. So uh, if you see, you can, you can go through these. Uh, and I want you to go through the, the diagram. It's nicely put together. Uh, but, but remember arbitrator, uh, and mediation, just a little slight, slightly different, uh, slightly different, right? So you have supervisory, uh, manager, labor relations manager, higher level manager, plant manager, corporate officer. Uh, then over here you have the national union officer, union grievance committee, local union, union shop steward, and employee grievance. So that's how it goes. So it goes from an employee grievance up to the shop steward who says, hey, we're going to take it to the local union. Uh, union grievance committee looks at it, says, yeah, we're going to roll with this. National union officer goes to arbitration uh, for that. All right. So nice uh, colorful diagram that they have. Um, the bargaining zone. This is a range of options between the initial and final offer that each party will consider before negotiations dissolve or reach an impasse, right? Uh, so they say, hey, these are the range of options that, that, that can be considered. Um, and it's between the first offer and the very last offer. Uh, each party will consider them before negotiations dissolve or reach an impasse. And that means they go away and now we're at a standstill and, uh, uh, nothing's happening. Nothing's moving. So meditation or meditation mediation is the use of a third party called a mediator who encourages both sides in a dispute to continue negotiations and often makes suggestions for resolving the dispute. But what they say is not binding and arbitration. It is binding uh, arbitration is agreement to bring in an impartial third party, a single arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators to render a binding decision in a labor dispute. All right. Uh, why do people like uh, mediation and arbitration? Because it keeps you away from litigation, right? And litigation, why do you want to stay away from litigation? Because litigation is expensive, uh, which means going to court.
A strike a strike occurs when workers uh, collectively refuse to go to work. They say, we're not going to go to work anymore. We're going to walk out. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but it happens, these things happen other ways. Like, it could be a lockout. The boss could say, hey, you know what? Uh, I don't need you guys. Uh, and I'm going to have some people in my other plan. I'm just going to lock the doors, right? That's the lockout. Uh, so a strike is a union strategy in which uh, workers refuse to go to work. The purpose is to further workers' objectives after an impasse and collective bargaining. And you do have a cooling off period uh, when workers in a critical industry return to their jobs while the union and management continue negotiations, right? So we're on strike, but we'll go back to our job uh, while you guys actually, you know, negotiate and figure it out. Uh, primary boycott is when union encourages uh, uh, both its members and general public not to buy the products of a firm involved in a labor dispute. So that's another way to flex your power. You know, let's just boycott it. Let's not buy the products. Let's not support them and see what happens. See how much money they lose. A secondary boycott is an attempt by labor uh, to convince others to stop doing business with a firm uh, as a subject of a primary boycott and is actually prohibited, right? Can't do that uh, by the Taft Hartley Act, right? Which does make sense why they can't do that, right? You don't want to, you know, cut off their business supply. That wouldn't be right either. And lockout, which I referenced to before uh, as an attempt by management to put pressure on uh, unions by temporarily uh, closing the business. So we're going to put the pressure on you. We're going to close the business just like uh, Major League Baseball said, hey, we won't have a season uh, till you guys uh, figure out how to negotiate with us. Uh, and there we go. There's an example. The conflict between the NFL players and the owners in 2011 resulted in the owners locking the players out of the team facilities for many months. Uh, how did the lockout affect the 2011-2012 season and what effect did it have on the fans, right? So it's a tough place, tough situation for the fans. They just want to go see them play football. And then, you know, maybe some of that anger is deflected towards the players, uh, but it really should be uh, def deflected towards uh you know, towards the people on the teams. Uh, and some of it was, rightfully so. But, uh, but they go through these different tactics and everything to say, hey, you know, if you guys don't want to adhere to what we're saying, then we'll just go ahead and not have a, not have a season. <clears throat> so an injunction is a court order uh, directing someone to do something or to refrain from doing something. So a uh, court order says that you have to do this or you refrain from doing this, right? Uh, so, you know, it sometimes it depends on, like, how your union. So I'll give you an NFL example, a guy, Ironhead Hayward, uh, his son, uh, because Ironhead, you know, passed away due to cancer, his son was wearing, you know, eye black uh, in memory of his father, and the NFL actually said, hey, you, you can't have you do that because that's something that's written into their contracts, into their bylaws. And you see, like, you'll see funny things, like people will have their uh, – you know, Adidas shirts turned inside out, but they have to do that because, you know, the NFL has a contract with this apparel company, which, you know, it's actually the other way around. But, uh, you know, if the NBA has a, a, a contract to make the jerseys with Adidas, then that's what needs to be worn. And in the contract, it states that, hey, you can't come out there and put a Nike shirt over your Adidas shirt to cover it up. Uh, to cross or not to cross, uh, I want you to uh, review that ethical decision. As I said, they're always uh, interesting. Uh, strike breakers, right, or scabs. Uh, workers hired uh, to do uh, the jobs of striking workers until the labor dispute is resolved, right? So these are people who come in uh, typically from other stores, like say we'll reference back to the grocery store days um, when they actually had a strike and those people who, who said, hey, you know what, I, I have to go work, right? And so they went and those are those are people who are called uh, strike, strike breakers. Uh, give backs. These are concessions made by union members to management, uh, gains from labor negotiations, and giving back to management to help employees remain competitive and thereby save jobs, right? And that's ideally what we want to do. We want to remain competitive. We want to save the jobs and we want to continue to be with the companies that we love. <clears throat> All right, so here is a nice map. So this is a union membership by state. All right. So we're in California, green 17%. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, the 17% or more, uh, you know, for uh, they say Pacific. So we have Alaska, California, we have Washington. And then 13% uh, to 16.9%, we have these speckled around Oregon, Nevada. That's interesting. And then all over here up uh, on the upper east coast and the midwest uh, you see about 13 to 16.9 percent uh 
9 to 12.9%. Probably don't have too much going on in terms of industry. Uh, go all the way down to 4.9% or less in, uh, in the south. Uh, and also southeast. So uh, just something to check out and look at. I'm not going to say, oh, you know, uh, is uh, is Arkansas, Are they do they fall in the green or do they fall in the teal or blue or something like that? Uh, test prep, right? So you want to go over your test prep. Uh, make sure that you're ready for your quiz for chapter, uh, chapter 12. And then also uh, ensure that you're ready for ultimately the test that will be on uh, on the last four chapters, which is uh, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. <clears throat> All right, so make sure you uh, read that about our our M I C K E Y M O U S C, right? Uh, and uh, they're they're running companies that owe their employees a, a, a raise, and you know rightfully so. Uh, so you know, look at executive compensation and and see you know how much some of these people make. They make quite a deal, quite a big deal of money. Uh, so uh, so you know, check that out. You can always check on the Forbes list to get that as well. And see what's you know most recently updated. College athletes, what are they worth? So if you look at Demarice's uh, you know uh, video, you'll see that it's talking specifically about this. And uh, you know you, people look at it from different perspectives, but uh, they do pull a lot of money into the university. Uh, so you know some people say, so why can't they be uh, taken care of? And some people say, hey, well you know it looks, works fine for us. And other people saying that they are the ones who are actually um, you know, kind of, you know, not not adhering to how the system should be. So be sure to read that article. A really good one, really resonant, relevant to, to what's going on today. <clears throat> uh, pay equity. I uh, didn't put the video up on this one, but there is a video that shows you uh, how, you know, I know I understand that, you know, typically men get paid more, but uh, some of the reasons, there, there are certain other reasons why, like, women get pushed to things like nursing uh, and teaching and, and guys get pushed towards science and, and technology and things of that nature. Uh, so, you know, read this over here about women's making, uh, women making pr important strides. Uh, <clears throat> so, if you see here, it says, we need to get an equal pay expert in. And this guy's like, hey, let's get a girl. It'll be cheaper, right? So, it, which can be, you know, true in certain instances. But, uh, you know, in a different class, I was, I was showing them that, you know, the reason why is because a lot of women do not negotiate. You have to negotiate whether you're a man, woman, or child looking out for a job. You must negotiate to say, hey, um, you know, this is what I want. Um, if you don't negotiate, then there's no, it's a thousand percent chance that you're not going to get what you're thinking in your head. Uh, sexual harassment. Those of you who are managers, you have to read, you know, or take a sexual harassment class every uh, two years. So these are unwelcome sexual advances, right? Unwelcome is the key word. Uh, requests for sexual favors and other conduct, uh, verbal or physical, of a sexual nature uh, that creates a hostile work environment. So if you create a hostile work environment, uh, you know, to say certain things in a, you know, sexual manner, then you're going to get hit with a sexual harassment charge, uh, which is not something that you want uh, listed. <clears throat> so be sure to review these uh, bullet points down here. <clears throat> So conduct on the job, uh, you can be considered illegal under specific uh, uh, conditions. And those are the conditions right there. Uh-oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right. Today, women make up almost half of the workforce in the United States, approximately three-fourths of women with children under 18, including 60% of mothers with children under age 3, are in the workplace, right? So if these people are in the workplace, then what are they doing with the kids? You know, hopefully not leaving them at home by themselves. Uh, but you have to think about uh, those those things and how they affect uh, how much someone is actually uh, truly getting, getting paid. <clears throat> Okay. On-site daycares is a great thing uh, for companies to have. Uh, so easy. Uh, you say, hey, I can take take the kid to work with me. Drop them off there in a the little play zone. Pick them up. Hopefully, you don't forget them, and uh, take them back home uh, from there. So, you know, some companies they provide lots and lots of amenities uh, for these students. Others, not so much. Right. <clears throat> Uh, drug testing, right? Uh, you know, be careful with drug testing because, 
you know, uh, com well, let me rewind back. Companies will get rid of background checks and drug testing very first and foremost if they're really trying to save some money. But then they soon realize that you have to know and understand, uh, you know, who you're hiring uh, before you do so. So uh, drug testing, background checks cost a lot of money. Company I used to work for was like, forget it. We'll just give them the, you know, the eyeball test. If they look good, they're good. We'll roll with them and they're, they, they will become a part of the company. And then you have a problem on your hands later on. Uh, violence in the workplace. Uh, I've actually seen it firsthand, uh, up and close and personal. And, uh, it was not, not a nice thing. Uh, the next Monday they came in with the boxes and said, you guys are both out of here. It was a company's CPA accountant and it was a company's legal counsel that got into a knockdown, uh, drag out fight, uh, in the workplace. Uh, so, I mean, they were actually in the parking lot, but that's still, you know, still part of the workplace in there. So it was pretty crazy. So, uh, try and steer far, far away from that. Uh, as well, uh, talk about OSHA, uh, <clears throat> Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, so they, you know, do things, check things out, and keep keep safety at the at the forefront of uh of the charge, which is which is definitely a good thing. Uh, more test prep there. Uh, last test prep for this particular chapter. Be sure to review that. Uh, be clear on it. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, now you're at the end uh, for business one, chapter twelve. Uh, here's the summary. Uh, be sure that you read, confer with your friends. Uh, on uh, anything that you may have missed or just some things that you may want to talk about. Uh, so the summary is right there. Great tool. Please be sure to use it. Uh, you know, it'll talk to you about like what was the first year and then you go look back and say, okay, this is what the answer is. And then how did the AFL CIO evolve? Right. So you could check out that, that evolution process as well. Uh, so, uh, so be sure to uh, read everything thoroughly. Uh, be sure to take your quiz and be starting to ramp up and study chapters 19, 11 and 12 for uh, for your next test. So as always, uh, be sure to please have a good day and a great week.